Good morning, good afternoon. We're just going to give a couple seconds as people are joining the webinar and then we'll get started. I am going to go ahead and get started. We have a full agenda today. Hello, my name is Sherry Steinig. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Communications at Generations United. I'm so thrilled so many of you are joining us today for our webinar and release of our new report, Promoting Intergenerational Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, a Michigan Initiative. We do have a full agenda today. After welcoming remarks, we'll hear from our report authors who will share an overview of intergenerational teaching and learning and highlights from the report, followed by a panel discussion with a phenomenal group of experts who are running a wide range of intergenerational initiatives at their colleges and universities. But before I get started, I wanted to alert you to a couple of housekeeping items. We are recording this webinar and everyone who registered for today's event will receive a link to the recording, the slides and the report. Please share it with others who are interested in this topic. To stay updated on intergenerational news, resources and more events like this, please follow Generations United on social me media. We would love to have you join our growing group on LinkedIn. We will be posting links to the relevant resources and chat, so be sure to keep an eye there. And then we'll also be sharing a link to the speaker bios and chat so you can learn more about everyone's extensive backgrounds. We are honored to, um, to be able to work with the Michigan Health Endowment Fund over the past few years to help strengthen intergenerational connections in Michigan and so appreciate their support of the report we are releasing today. I'm thrilled that Carrie Setterberg, Vice President of Programs and Director of Healthy Aging at the Health Fund, is with us today to provide some welcoming remarks. So you can take it away, Carrie. Great. Well, thank you, Sherry. And uh, thank you. A huge shout out to the whole Generations United team for pulling us all together today to talk about such an important topic. Uh, I am honored to be here to represent the Michigan Health Endowment Fund. We have played just a very small role in a very important initiative um, that you'll hear more about today um, that really have um, been the heart of making this intergenerational magic happen. And we are just so excited excited um, to have the unveiling of this report and really to continue the dialogue about um, intergenerational programs. Uh, at the Michigan Health Endowment Fund, uh, we are very supportive of intergenerational work. Our mission is to improve the health and well-being of kids and older adults, so it is right in our wheelhouse. Uh, and so again, we are just very excited about um, the work that you're going to be hearing from, from our esteemed panelists. Uh, and I don't want to uh, take away time from them because they really are the heart and soul of this work, but I just was so excited that I wanted to just crash this webinar just to um, share our enthusiasm and also just to promote the intergenerational work more broadly. I know we don't have a lot of time today, but I will drop my email in the chat if folks want to continue the conversation about this work or any other intergenerational work going forward. So with that, Sherry, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Carrie, and thank you to the Health Fund. It's not very often that we find funders who recognize the value and importance of intergenerational connections and who also are such warm and caring partners. So we really appreciate um, you and all the work that you do. Before I turn the program over to my colleagues, I wanted to share just a little bit about Generations United. Um, for those of you who may not know us, Generations United is a nonprofit that strengthens practices and policies to benefit all generations. In the words of one of our founders, Jack Osofsky, who was then the executive director of the National Council on Aging, we formed Generations United to argue for a caring society. Care and connection are really at the core of all of our work. In addition to promoting the many different forms of intergenerational engagement, we have a number of initiatives supporting kinship and grand families. One of the ways we help to build connections is through our global conference, and we hope you will plan to join us for our next conference in summer 2025 in Louisville, 
Kentucky. Conference dates and the call for sessions will be coming out soon. Our website, the easily to remember gu.org, has a wealth of information on intergenerational and kinship topics. We have an intergenerational program database, um, a resource library. You can search in the upper right hand corner or reach out to us for more information. I'm now pleased to turn the program over to the co-leads of this project and co-authors of this report, Dr. Nancy Hankin and Doc Dr. Heather Renter. Before joining Generations United as a senior fellow, Nancy was the founding executive director of the Intergenerational Center at Temple University for over 30 years. If you have done even the slightest amount of research on intergenerational practice, I know her name has come up. Heather is currently the Director of Education and Research at Heritage Community of Kalamazoo. She was previously an Associate Professor for the Public Health Program at Grand Valley State University, where she advised and taught students in health promotion. As I turn it over to Nancy, I just wanna share the QR code for the report. You can use the camera on your phone to scan the code. Um, the link is below, and I'll also put the link in chat. So Nancy, take it away. Thanks, Sherry, and thank you all for being here. It was so exciting to look at the list of attendees and to see people from all over the world who are interested in this topic. Um, this is a kind of a preliminary report, basically um, looking at some things we've seen in the research and also going a little deeper in Michigan. And we just hope it's the beginning of lots of discussions um, that we can have to really promote this idea of intergenerational teaching and learning. Uh, next. So I'm going to give you, yeah, I'm going to give you a little overview of what we think about when we think about intergenerational teaching and learning. But what we focus on here is the reciprocal sharing of expertise that intentionally uses generational perspectives as part of the learning content. So it's a two-way transfer of knowledge, not just one group, uh, one generation teaching another. And it's designed to be mutually beneficial and promote understanding across generations. It's also a great vehicle for bringing diverse ages together to address um, community concerns. So we did a lot of research and here are four categories that research have said um, are ways that intergenerational learning can, can be uh, presented. Agree, um, and they definitely overlap. So the first is learning from each other. And that's um, maybe a course where old young people are teaching technology to older people. So the um, sharing of generational perspectives isn't necessarily the focus. It's really on how can they share skills with each other, although they understand that they're from different generations. Learning together are age heterogeneous environments that intentionally draw upon the generational perspectives um, as part of the learning. So it could be any topic, but the faculty probably draw upon what are the insights and experiences of people of different generations. Learning about each other is specifically geared to having young students and older, and older people share their insights and learn about um, some of the challenges and experiences they've had over the lifespan. So it's more lifespan focus. And project-oriented learning is really collaborative learning. Um, our friends at CoGenerate um, are looking into this, and it really looks at how a project can be a vehicle for learning. And by bringing the strengths of older people and young people together, they can really make a difference in their community. Um, okay, next. So there's no rigid definition of intergenerational teaching and learning. And as you can see, there are many ways of, many doorways, many, many uh, approaches to doing this work. But rather than thinking about uh, a rigid definition, I, we're trying to look at principles that underlie this work. So reciprocity, clearly learning is bi-directional and reciprocal. All participants have an opportunity to learn and an opportunity to teach, mutual respect. We hope people will relate to each other as individuals, not just members of a group. And then, of course, they respect the perspectives and knowledge and skills of um, each person involved. Asset-based and strength-based, very important. We really want to build on each generation's strengths and to use those strengths to facilitate and promote understanding. And this is particularly important when we maybe connect college students with frail elders and focus on their vulnerabilities. One of the things about this approach is let's think about not only the challenges they face, but also the strengths they build and the fact that they've been so resilient in making it to this point in life. 
Inclusivity, of course, we want to include all ages and abilities in shaping the intergenerational learning opportunity and make sure that everyone has an opportunity uh, to contribute their knowledge and their experiences. And inclusivity also includes acknowledgement of various identities linked to age, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religiosity, and, and others. Very important, it's relationship focused. This work is about meaningful relationships. It's not just about throwing old people and young people together in a room and hoping that things will happen. Um, it really is about intentionally fostering authentic cross-age connections, uh, which can increase social capital uh, for everybody. We hope that this work is culturally grounded and that the learning content reflects differences in norms and values and attitudes of different generations and cultures. It is intentional, hopefully, we hope that it is intentional um, in trying to combat ageism and dispel age-related stereotypes. Um, Although this nece is necessarily identified as a goal in some courses, we're hoping to raise awareness about the importance of using this strategy to combat ageism. And finally, this isn't just about gerontology courses. It's not just about aging. It, all disciplines can benefit by integrating this intergenerational approach into the curriculum and utilizing a lifespan perspective, no matter what the topic is. Okay, next. So why now? You know, many of us, I've been doing this work for about 45 years, but why is it particularly important now? What's an intergenerational opportunity, particularly for higher education institutions? Well, one is we know demographic changes. The longevity revolution is impacting how we live and work. Um, the aging population has grown, has grown from 56 million in 2020. It's gonna be 94.7 million in 2060. This presents both challenges and opportunities. There are many older adults who wanna continue learning. They wanna continue contributing to their communities. But there'll also be many who need health and social services that are provided by a knowledgeable and non-ageist workforce. Population is also becoming much more racially and ethnically diverse. We're seeing a racial generational gap in which the younger generation influenced by recent immigration is more diverse than older generations. So the potential for competing agendas between an older white electorate and a younger population increasingly of color reinforces the need to foster understanding across ages and other racial and ethnic divides. Um, you know, although there's much more age diversity right now, age segregation and ageism is on the rise. You know, we live and work in age uh, in silos and this deprives both young people and older adults of sources of support it perpetuates stereotypes. It contributes to feelings of loneliness. And age segregation is both a cause and a consequence of ageism. And that can be defined as stereotypes and prejudices and discrimination directed toward people based on their age. So research suggests that ageist beliefs decrease older adults' physical and mental health. And it also reinforces young people's fear of aging and contributes to their denial of the elder within. The intersection of ageism and structural racism is particularly harmful to older adults from historically marginalized communities. Now, workforce preparation. You know what? A growing older adult population requires a workforce that is trained to understand the needs and the strengths of people as they age. And although there are many jobs um, involving either caring for older adults or interacting with older adults, unfortunately, student interest has remained relatively stagnant. So it's not only that we need to prepare people in health and social services to, to interact more effectively, everybody in every discipline needs to develop the competencies to communicate with different generations in the workforce, in the workforce and to live in an age diverse world. Across the country, you know, the number of young adult students in colleges and universities has decreased. We see this everywhere. Clearly, higher education uh, would, institutions would benefit by offering educational opportunities for people of all ages, including older adults. And a number of institutions are cultivating age-friendly campuses that intentionally promote age inclusivity. 
I encourage you to check out the Global Age-Friendly University Initiative that's discussed in the report. There are lots of exciting things happening all over, and I encourage all of you to look at that and see if your university can become part of this initiative. And finally, social isolation and loneliness. We're all aware of the detrimental effects of loneliness on all age groups, and the pandemic unfortunately highlighted the need to promote opportunities for social connectedness, particularly across ages. So engaging college students with older adults can reduce each generation's sense of isolation and improve overall health and well-being for everyone. So although higher education institutions have primarily focused on the education of young adults, there's a potential for these institutions to become age-integrated places that offer transformative learning experiences to people of all ages. And I'm gonna turn this over now, and there's much more in our report. So this is kind of highlights of the report and I hope you will read that. But I'm gonna turn this over to my colleague, Heather, right now, who will tell you a little bit about what's in the report. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll start with, um, if we can advance them to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk about the goal of the Michigan Initiative just briefly. So all of the things that Nancy just went through, those, those points of how our demography is changing, how the college and university setting has changed over the years, in line or in parallel with some of those demographic changes that we've seen in the aging population, knowing that we're our aging population is growing and that it's siloed and that there's this age segregation um, and that many older adults are aging um, with, with isolation and um, with complex life limiting illness. So the impetus for our work through Generations United and the Michigan Health Endowment Fund was really born out of this desire to really explore how intergenerational teaching and learning um, starting in the community and in our institutions of higher education here in Michigan could be harnessed or leveraged to really at the very end um, for the goal of improving health and wellness for older adults, as well as for people in other generations, primarily um, college students. So we believed that this work, and we, we do believe that this work um, through high quality intergenerational teaching and learning that really embraces those principles that Nancy talked about, can reduce ageism, can improve health outcomes for older adults, um, and really ultimately prepare our students and our future health force, our workforce, to engage with older adults um, and for older adults to engage with younger generations in a, in a way that's very positive and um, is really meaningful for everyone involved. And when you do that, you get some of that generational empathy and collaboration that can really move a whole society forward in meaningful ways. So it sounds a little um, precious maybe, but it, uh, we thought it was an important and really underutilized aspect um, that could be brought into um, higher education. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna share um, five of the, of the um, kind of findings from, from the report. So again, like Nancy uh, mentioned, please go back to the report. You can read about each one of these categories. For the sake of time and wanting to get to our panelists, I'm just gonna briefly mention these here. So you might wanna think about these as on-ramps, if you will. So if you're in an institution of higher education, um, from that context and position, you might think like, how do I start? How do I get involved or bring or develop or further um, utilize intergenerational teaching and learning? So from our work here in Michigan, we identified five primary ways, and these are in no particular order. So the first was intergenerational or IG on the screen, um, service learning. So these are examples of, of programs where students come together, again, from multiple disciplines, not just the health professions, um, but certainly the health professions would be included in that, um, where they do some kind of service learning project. And sometimes these are coordinated through a formal service learning office or department within an institution. The second is field placements and practicum. So if you do work in the health sciences, you might be familiar with having for example, nursing students or occupational therapy students that might go into a long-term care facility or a senior living community and do um, service-related work or projects with older adults. So while we would include that as intergenerational teaching and learning, I want to, again, kind of point you back to those principles that Nancy um, discussed of like what makes really good, <laughs> um, really beneficial, high quality intergenerational teaching and learning. And it's that reciprocal 
um, intergenerational approach. So it's not just students coming in to do, for example, foot care for diabetic patients, but again, learning from, learning with, learning about one another in ways that are meaningful for both parties. The third way was through intergenerational classroom learning. So this might be where an instructor brings students and older adults together through multiple, there's multiple ways to do that, um, but it's part of the classroom learning. So having students and older adults do um, coursework together or a project together or learn about or um, explore something together in the classroom was the third way that we saw as kind of an on-ramp to intergenerational teaching and learning. The fourth was intergenerational research. And again, because we want this to be mutually beneficial to both the both sets of, of learners, regardless of age, um, that one can sometimes be a little bit more difficult to see some of those, um, the reciprocity there. And we that was probably one that we had fewer examples of, um, at least here in Michigan. And then the last was extracurricular projects, which might bring students, again, from different disciplines together to work on projects that are specific around older adults and or intergenerational teaching and learning. Next slide, please. So I would imagine that many of you, if you have any interest in or experience with intergenerational teaching and learning, can imagine or are familiar with some of the benefits um, that are reaped through intergenerational teaching and learning. So in our study, again, here in Michigan, um, we found that there is a greater understanding and appreciation of older adults. So this really moves towards that breaking down of ageism and ageist perceptions and beliefs, and not just on the part of younger students who might be interacting with older adults, but of older adults and their perceptions of younger individuals as well. The second was increased skills in working with older adults. And if you really, really start thinking about this, um, we can imagine that there really is a skill set in working with people from different generations. Increasingly, as generational um, ideas and skills and practices and daily occupation has changed and how rapidly it has changed over the last 20 to 40 years. So those, that skill set was something that can be very valuable. Um, and learning how to work with and talk to and communicate um, and move forward um, activities with different generations. The third was an increased sense of connectedness between generations. So again, you might imagine that as greater technology has entered our lives, that there's less opportunity um, for people to relate to one another. So a 90 year old and a nine year old today have less in common generationally than so when that 90 year old was nine years old, thinking about someone who was 90 then. Um, so it's a, a big advantage is just recognizing that there is generational solidarity and harmony and that we do have um, things in common with generations in front of us, as well as the generations behind us. The fourth was an improved perspective of history. So just knowledge of and awareness of history and how things work. And um, in some cases, just how people cope and adapt to change. And lastly, a recognition of unconscious bias and an increased curiosity about aging. So kind of pushing against, again, some of those ageist perspectives and beliefs, um, fear of older adults or people that are much older, um, and some of the unconscious bias that is often part of a daily American culture, particularly um, in students who are exploring um, different topics and disciplines and professions. Next slide, please. Okay, I'll quickly talk about the perceived challenges. Now, again, these were perceived challenges. Um, when we talk to people within Michigan, what are some of the things that they imagine or might have actually experienced in doing um, intergenerational teaching and learning. So these challenges can come from the various levels or systems that we encounter in higher ed, as well as within the communities and within the larger system that people live and work. Um, so people can come at these differently, um, and some of these might have a larger impact for some people, depending on their institution or their space in society um, and from which they're trying to operate to do this type of work. One thing we heard a lot was the impact of the pandemic 
And that had to do with having programs that were already started or work that was being done that was seen as intergenerational and then having to stop that or change it considerably in, the term, in terms of format throughout the pandemic. And then coming out of the pandemic, not having the resources in place to really pick back up and start that work again. So we hope that one will kind of work itself out as time goes on. A second um, challenge was the ambivalence about working with older adults. That might be faculty, it might be school administrators, it might also be students, and it might be older adults themselves. So that can come in a lot of different sizes and shapes. Um, and similarly, finding and engaging older adults. You know, I've, I've had older adults say to me, well, I don't have anything to teach anyone or I don't have anything to offer. Um, and we know that's not true, um, but sometimes adding that to an already um, heavy set of requirements for teaching a class or you know, can, working in higher education with all of the, the um, responsibilities that come with that, um, adding working with another population can be sometimes um, stressful. So the last two have to do with time constraints and logistical challenges. So how do you get older adults that might be differently abled into the classroom or a group of students into a place where older adults might be more convenient um, for them to, to meet? Um, how do you deal with um, the, the window of a 15 or 14 week semester or the academic year and so on and so forth. So there are some challenges, very real challenges that go along with intergenerational teaching and learning, um, but we have some very good examples of how that has been overcome. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to um, Nancy and she is gonna talk about um, some of the promising practices that we encountered here in Michigan. Thanks, Heather. And can we go to the next slide? So I'm actually not going to talk in depth about these. A lot of these are discussed in the report. Um, and again, this is the beginning of promising practices. We are so excited that so many of you are either interested or have developed programs and courses and seminars that you can share with us. So we'll be sending out some information, some requests for information from you. And we're going to, this is a work in progress. We really want this to be a living document where we can add more. So these are some of the topics that we discussed with uh, interviewees and that we looked at in the research. How do you frame intergenerational learning? How do you build partnerships and identify elders? What are some effective strategies for engaging faculty and students, for addressing ageism, and actually for facilitating intergenerational learning? But rather than my talking about these, we have a great panel. Next slide. Um, and so we not only looked at programs in Michigan, but then we started trying to do an inventory of programs around the United States, which is not so easy because some sometimes people identify what they're doing is intergenerational, sometimes it's age friendly, sometimes it's just connecting with other age groups. Um, so we did find, uh, identify uh, a number of different programs which are listed in the appendix in the report. And again, we wanna add to this list over time, but we decided to invite four people who are doing different kinds of programs, are in different parts of the country um, and are kind of entering through different doorways. So I'm just going to interview, uh, introduce them, and then we're going to have them answer some questions and hopefully discuss with each other um, some of the strategies that um, they found effective. So first we have Natalie Galucha, who is the center manager with the um, Harvey Friedman Center for Aging at the Institute for Public Health at Washington University. Welcome, Natalie. Then we have Adam uh, Gretman, who is an associate professor for Professor of Art Education at the School of Art Institute of Chicago. We have Alicia Jones, who is an assistant professor in uh, occupational therapy at Eastern Michigan University, and also was a member of our advisory group in Michigan for this report. And finally, uh, welcome to Lauren Lowe, who is a writer, a teaching artist, um, and she runs the intergenerational course at Drexel University. So all of them will be sharing their experiences and I think we'll just move forward. So welcome all of you. And I think we'll have all four of us on the, yep, there we, where are the four of us? Okay, there you are. Okay. Um, 
So I, let's, let's see, what's we need to add in there. Yeah, there you are, great. Okay, so I'd like each of you to briefly describe how did you get into this? What motivated you to, to do intergenerational work? And then give like maybe a couple minute overview of the work you do. So let's start with Natalie. Well, just roam around a little bit. So how did you get into this, Natalie? And what are you doing at WashU? Sure. Um, so I will have to be honest, I am not the originator of this course, um, but as part of my role with the Center for Aging, I was able to have the opportunity um, to become very involved with it. But I am a gerontological social worker, so I've always been very interested um, in working with older adults. And then also um, lately, we've really been focusing on, you know, one of the, the promising practices that you mentioned, Nancy, of reducing ageism. Um, of working in that uh, work and knowing how important these intergenerational interactions are. So that's definitely something that's kept me very engaged um, in this work and continuing to work um, on this course as well. So we have a course at WashU. It is for undergraduate students and in particular, first semester undergraduate students. So we have them very early on in their college careers, which we think is really important to help shifting um, their understanding of aging and then potentially um, continuing an introductory where they're maybe gonna work in an aging related field or something like that. So that's one of the main goals of our course, but our course is called When I'm 64, Transforming Your Future. So it is really talking about all of the different aspects and components of aging. So each week throughout the semester is on a different topic. Um, we start uh, really micro with your body, and then we move more broadly into community and home and transportation. Um, talk about family and friends and your death and, and those sorts of things. So each week is a different topic. And then the one of the main things that we teach in the course as well is that aging is something that's personal and something that's professional. So that's been a big driver and goal of the course. So not only are these things that we have to, that we're dealing with in our personal lives, because we're all aging, we have aging parents, aging relatives, but then also knowing it's professional and not only that maybe you're going to work in a field directly in the aging field, but then also we're working in multi-generational workforces and knowing that it's important to be able to communicate and work in those workplaces and that maybe we're going to have interactions with people of all ages. So we really focus and weave that into each of the topics as well. Um, and then the other big component then that makes it intergenerational is not only that are we teaching about aging to these younger students, but we have older adults that take the class along with them. So we have um, about 75 undergraduates that are in the class and we have about 15 to 20 older adults that take the course as well. Um, and they have always told us that they learn just as much about aging as the younger students are. And they learn from the younger students as much as the older students. So there's definitely that reciprocity in the conversations that are able to be had and the older adults are to provide that real life um, perspective on what we're teaching about as well. And the one last comment I would make is it's also an interdisciplinary course. So it is taught by faculty in occupational therapy, psychology, and social work to, again, just provide a really broad range of all of the examples um, that can be provided. Great. Very concise. Thank you, Natalie. And we're going to go into more detail then, but I, I love the fact that it's personal and professional. Um, and and that you know interaction across ages is key to this, but that you also have the perspectives of the three faculty members who work together. Um, so thank you, and I we're looking forward to going even deeper with the WashU. And I also love that it's freshman year, because often people don't talk about this stuff later on. But the fact that you're getting them early on to say, well, this either could be a career or this is the world you're living in, you know, is very important. Great. Uh, Lauren, let's go to you next. Um, so you're at Drexel University. So tell us a little bit of how you got involved. And I know, not that you're that old now, but you were really young when you started. <laughs> it has. It's officially been a decade. Um, so that feels significant. But uh, yeah, so I actually got started with Writer's Room, which is a university community literary arts program. I can drop our website in the chat here. Um, I actually got involved first as an undergraduate student, so I was 19 when I joined, and as Nancy said, I'm not 19 anymore, 
Um, and it really, for me, was I studied right. I wanted to study writing in college, but more importantly, I was having a really difficult time connecting with uh, others at this university in particular. Drexel is an urban campus. It's a commuter school. We have a co-op program, so it's very fast paced around the quarter system. Um, and I still hear a lot of students now say that it's, it's really difficult to find community and sustain relationships when all of these different um, other like structures are happening at the university here and writer's room. I always say we were kind of brand new at Drexel at the same time. And it was basically like I walked into my first workshop and then didn't leave. And it was really different from everywhere else that I um, experienced on campus and a lot of the reasons that Nancy I heard you say you know the two-way transfer of relationship and we always say it's transformative it's not transactional um, so there were a lot of things where you know I'm learning you're building skills like very tangible hard skills for um, professional careers but this was a place where I was really building relationships that still last uh, we just had our last class of the course that I teach now which is called RIT 290 it's the writer's room experience so we try to just like take everything that we do um, it's really almost like a workshop based class for um, undergraduates and neighbors to study together in the classroom and um, so they could get course credit but at the end of the class one of the elders in the classroom his name is Norman he's 81 um, he just kind of he was taking his time writing and I was like, Mr. Kane, do you want to share? And he looked at all the students and he went, this has been going on for a long time. You know, so it's like those relationships that we've built, it's really hard to walk away from that. And they're really long lasting and meaningful. So the work that we actually do though at Writer's Room is uh, we run a lot of different public programming. Everything we do is free and open to all. We're ages 18 to 80, as we say, and diverse in about every way that you can imagine. And we've started with writing workshops, but it's expanded into other art forms and also even into an affordable housing project <laughs> um, because we're based in West Philadelphia and we found that, you know, students are a large part of the displacement force here inadvertently, whether we mean to be or not. And um, so our little writing program has expanded into working on uh, exploring an art centered model for intergenerational co-living. Um, to see how students can actually be home sharers with elder neighbors to help them age in place and afford um, to be able to do home repairs so that they can stay in the neighborhood. And part of what Writer's Room really does for this is that it's that intergenerational bond and it is the relationship piece that sometimes we say like it feels a little bit woo-woo and heart-centered, but that is the thing that like makes all of the other disciplines come together. So um, we have a lot of colleagues across the university in the School of Education um, doing intergenerational research, uh, people from uh, urban design and architects all working across, we've worked with public health, um, because as we've identified on this panel, you know, there are a lot of different intersections for um, talking about intergenerational learning. Great. I, I know all of you could go on and on, but yeah. it's very exciting how Writers Room has developed over the time, even the decade you've been there. And the Second Story Initiative, um, I think, I don't know if you can put that in there. I know it's in the report, too. Um, this housing initiative is certainly very unique and really exciting for a university to be working so closely with neighbors, mostly older neighbors, um, and who got into this because they care about each other. And that's what's exciting there. Great. Um, Alicia, let's go to Michigan, Eastern Michigan U. Tell us a little bit how you got involved and what you're doing in OT. Hi. So my primary background is occupational therapy. I am an occupational therapist and I started off uh, working in skilled nursing and I did a lot of clinical work with older adults. So that's where I got started in working with older adults in general. Um, this program actually was presented to me in its birthing process from another one of our departments called Engage. And so they were, they received some grant funding that in terms of when COVID and quarantine, and it was a lot of social isolation going around with older adults. And so the department of Engage had received some grant funding to potentially do like a tech training program. And so I was approached with the program. And so our program is called Digital Connecting Corps, and we are housed primarily in a senior center um, at Ypsilanti, and we teach older adults how to use technology, and occupational therapy students do that. So 
they range from our program is two and a half years. So we have a mixture of first year and second year occupational therapy master's level students. And they teach older adults to use technology beyond basic internet usage. So we do a lot of fun things, Canva, YouTube, uh, Spotify, you name it. Uh, we do it. We have a primary program that is established. However, as the weeks go on, it's it's 12 weeks in length and we roll it based off of each semester. And so after week three is typically when our older adults are like, hey, can you teach me how to do this? And so we do modules based off of their interests as, as well. I am, I've officially, uh, since we are approaching our third year, I am almost like the man behind the curtain. So it is 100%. Well, woman behind the curtain, right? <laughs> and so it is 100% intergenerational. I just make sure all of the supplies are ordered and the students, they really have, they love it because I give them a lot of autonomy in terms of just like that relationship building. And they really get a chance to focus on like their needs, right? You know, not everybody wants to go to the grocery store. So teaching them how to use like grocery apps and things in that nature. But it also satisfies our students service learning. It allows them to get some clinical experience because it is community dwelling older adults. However, we take into account that older adults, some of them may have chronic conditions. And so our technology, the accessibility and just how you go about teaching the class takes into account for that as well. Um, so yeah, we are approaching year three and it's it's weekly for two hours. <laughs> the two hours usually goes over because it's not just, you know, I'm going to teach you this step and you do it. It's a lot of, you know, fun, playful banter. So it's really nice. Great. Great. Thank you. And again, this is an example of it. You go into it as you know, you're teaching technology. But from what I've heard from you, um, their relationships are built. People are having fun. They're socializing. They're engaging. Um, and so the older people are learning about the students. The students are learning about the older people in addition to teaching a skill. Okay, Adam, we want to hear from you um, at the Art Institute, and you're doing a really interesting program. So um, tell me a little bit about like how you got into it and an overview of the program. Great. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for the invitation to be here today. Um, so I am one of the co-founders and co-facilitators of the LGBTQ plus intergenerational dialogue project. Um, this is a project that my co-founder and I uh, started in 2019, so we just finished our fifth year. Um, with a simple premise of what happens if we bring young adult LGBTQ plus identified individuals into conversation with LGBTQ plus elders, um, knowing that there is a large generation gap between those two populations. Uh, and so over the five years that has uh, kind of developed and expanded in a range of ways, um, but it really started out, um, out of listening to both students that my co-founder and I, Karen Morris, heard um, the students talk about not knowing that LGBTQ plus elders existed. They'd not seen them, right? They're in an invisible population. Um, and then working with our community partner, who's the senior services manager at the Senior Services Center uh, in Chicago for the LGBTQ plus community, um, and hearing elders talk about their wish to communicate and learn from LGBTQ plus young people, because they recognize that oftentimes social movements are led by young people um, and they were hearing things and they wanted to know more about it. Um, so from listening to those two kind of um, stakeholders, um, we decided to kind of bring together um, in an educational project um, these two generations to dialogue um, with one another. So the project uh, operates over nine months, so an academic school year. Um, and we bring together 15 young adults and 15 elders um, for biweekly dialogues. Um, and as part of that dialogue, we include storytelling. Um, in the end of the first fall semester, we do a big storytelling extravaganza where everybody kind of gets to hear a story from one another. And then in the spring semester, we do a community collaborative art making project that ends with a public art exhibition that's housed at the community center where the project is hosted. Um, and so for me, given the current political climate around LGBTQ plus issues, um, the project has kind of grown to really address um, both elder and younger students kind of concerns uh, and fears with elders oftentimes giving insights into having navigated some of these issues in their own lives. 
um, and Younger is helping to see those issues uh, in new light around kind of the curriculum conversations and other issues. Um, I think that might have covered everything for now. Yeah, well, well, yeah, well, great. And this is a wonderful project. Um, not only is it timely and needed, but it also, again, looks at the importance of exchanging information, build understanding history, understand connecting the past, the present and the future and having groups be, be there to support each other. We don't always have spaces where these kinds of conversations can happen. The fact that you've created that that space for the dialogue, I think is really great. So let's go, we can't do all the promising practices, but let's look at some of them. Um, so one of the things that's really important, you can't do this alone. This has to be a partnership. Um, so how do you build both internal and external partnerships? Um, so I know Natalie, you're a center on aging. I don't know if others are connected to center on aging or if you're like, how, how do you connect with maybe retired faculty or alumni or area um, organizations? One of the things that we found when we talked to people is not all like not all service learning organizations engage uh, organizations serving elders. Uh, they often wait till someone asks them for um, to be involved. So I'm just wondering for all of you, you know, what are a couple of things? Who do you who do you partner with, and kind of what makes it successful? Uh, so I don't care who wants Natalie. You must start, then we'll go around. Sure. Yeah, I can start. Um, so we've been lucky that we've had some good connections with a couple of organizations in St. Louis. Um, so, you know, that serve older adults in particular. So that's definitely, you know, one area to start. We have um, a nonprofit in St. Louis called STL Village, and they are part of, there's actually a national movement for villages, um, or, you know, and they're, they're not like the villages you hear of in Florida, but um, a village that provides services to older adults. It's very much of a reciprocal program. Um, so volunteer-based services, social programs and activities and all of that. So these are older adults who are living in community um, and have, you know, been engaged in interest. So we've had a, a strong partnership with them for the past, um, we've been teaching the course for 10 years, for pretty much the past 10 years that we've had the course. Um, and, you know, I've been grateful to have a lot of word of mouth of that, you know, people hear about the course and, and want to be able to take it. So in a sense, it's kind of a, a benefit of being a part of that organization as you get the opportunity to then participate um, as an older student in our course. So that's one partnership. Our other partnership that we just started recently um, is actually with our Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, um, which a lot of universities have as well. So they have their own curriculum and their own um, courses that they teach the specific um, to older adults, but again, people who are very um, interested in learning and, you know, and have been a very, very good partner as well um, to, to having some people be a part of the class. So there's definitely some opportunity to, to search out, um, you know, those types of organizations that are in your communities, because um, usually you have older adults that are a part of that, that then want to be very engaged as well. Great. And I'm glad you mentioned Ollie because we have quite a few people from different Ollies around the country um, involved. And again, sometimes they're involved, they're connected to the university, sometimes they're not, but it's kind of a just ready-made group of people who might be interested, and particularly in a course like this. Uh, Lauren, you work with um with neighbors, and I'm wondering, like I know you tell a little bit about the Dornsife Center, but how do you message to older adults? Like, how do they get involved? And why um, would they get involved? It's so funny. I was just thinking as you were talking about other organizations, I was like, wow, a lot of our neighbors, it was by word of mouth, actually, the same way that the students come in. Um, you know, a lot of them, we actually, Norman, the man I referenced earlier, we've joked that he's kind of head recruiter um, accidentally because they're already in different groups for seniors. So they would say, hey, I'm going to this workshop. Do you want to come down? Like, you should really come. And then we would just get to know them there. And so um, I think that's another special dynamic is to when I talk about the 10 year relationships, I think for students on the younger side, that's kind of new for us as we're growing up. And it's been just as much of a pleasure to see the elders have those longstanding relationships to form. Um, so they connect us with a lot of organizations uh, as well. And we do work really closely with the Mantra Civic Association, which is the neighborhood association that's close to um, Drexel's campus. And I do also think that Rachel Wenrick, our founding director, has been really intentional about doing research on um, 
different organizations around the state, around the country, and in this region that are that are working to serve older adults and actually reaching out actively and making those connections. And she worked really hard to build that relationship with Mantua Civic Association. I, I think it, you know, it took a few years to come in with the university logo on our back where our mascot is the dragon. So we're always like, you know, people are a little suspicious sometimes when you roll up with the dragons into the neighborhood. But um, we, she's real and she's very radically transparent and just herself. And um, so now it's having that neighborhood connection where it's who's going to know the neighborhood and the people in it better than the people that are already working there. And so we co-create everything with them and, and we follow their lead on a lot. But she was very strategic and I think also generally you in, in wanting to make those connections intentionally. Great. So I think you're losing a lot of my favorite words, intentionality, right. co-creation, authenticity. Those are all really important to because you're building trust and right. particularly in a neighborhood. And this is very neighborhood based in West Philadelphia. So it's really important that the older adults in the neighborhood trust Drexel and Drexel students and that you grow to um to engage them in a way that's powerful and, and meaningful. And I know you do that. So that's great. Um, Alicia, uh, I know you're working with Ipsy Senior Center. So mm -hmm. are there certain things that are really working because you, you know, have a relationship with the Ipsy Senior Center? So the Senior Center, it's, it's primarily housed there in terms of like space. So Many of us, if you think about a university campus, it can be very intimidating, right? Parking is a nightmare. Um, our campus is very healy. So our senior center, it's housed right in like their main like park and recreations hub. So, you know, like the parking lot and just the accessibility to get into the space is just way more accommodating. And so so that is where we partner with them with the space in terms of like building the occupational therapy department partner with our actual, we have a engage is like our community based uh, department that they do a lot of the contractual obligations for community partners. And honestly, like our participants came from word of mouth, right? Um, since we do technology, we teach older adults how to use a laptop device, which can be extremely intimidating. And a lot of it came from word of mouth of like, you know, can I bring a friend in? And they're like, right. They don't want to come, but it's like, well, have them try a day. And it's just like, okay, this is really nice. So ours primarily came from word of mouth. And then some of our participants are actual members of like, um, like the township community center. And so they started putting our class like, hey, there's this class house here out of Ypsilanti Senior Center that, how you know, just with the information. And so word of mouth was mainly like our, you know, biggest marketing tool for sure. Yeah. It's always true, isn't it? When people say, oh, we need to like develop these flyers and stick them up. It doesn't work. It's about word of mouth. It's about trust. It's about building relationships and having a good experience so that more people come. So Adam, you too work primarily with the senior center, right? Um, that you refer to. Um, so what's working for you? What what makes this uh, the partnership um, you know, effective? Yeah, so we partner with the Center on Addison, which is the Senior Services Division of the Center on Halstead. Uh, and then we also have other faculty who are part of our co-facilitation team. So we also um, include folks from the University of Illinois, Chicago and the University of Chicago. Um, so it's a kind of multi-university and community engaged project. I think what we've learned is um, being very transparent about the different needs different organizations have. And so the development of the project was at the root, um, both what are the needs of college students and what are the needs of the LGBTQ plus elders that uh, the Center on Addison serves and how do we find ways to meet the needs of both of those populations um, in ways that are creative, that are ways kind of thinking beyond um, what um, either we have done in the university or what the senior services people have done. Um, and you know, one of the benefits of working with the senior service agency that we do is that it provides the space where our project meets, and that includes ha having access to a kitchen and a dining room, because one of the key components of our project is sharing a meal with one another. Um, because one of the uh, things about building community is doing it while break breaking bread, but also recognizing that some of the members of the project are food insecure. So it's ways in which we kind of think through what the partnership brings both in terms of needs, but then also the assets um, and how we can work together to 
um, fulfill those goals and needs together. That's great. So we have a few minutes and I want to hit a lot of things. So I don't know what I'm going to, um, is there anyone who wants to say one thing about how do you get students? Like, is there a message that you're giving to the students as you're framing? We found that, you know, you have to be careful about how you're selling this. Um, so does anyone have like one, one uh, good experience about um, getting students involved? And do you feel there's resistance or you feel like they're just anxious to come? I can start. So I haven't personally experienced resistance. I usually do a call to the students like, hey, I'm looking for participants and it's a volunteer sign up. The since the beginning, um, now that it has been running for a few years now, the word of mouth is that this program is very fun. So students are also your best marketing tools. Like this right. program is right. fun, right? It can be Im right. intimidating if you think about older adults have been essentially always been like kind of associated with like that quote unquote client population. Right. But the students are like, it's fun, you know, so they have been been the best marketing tool. But I do, I treat them more as stakeholders than I do students. So they do take a lot of ownership over the program than just these are the steps these are the guidelines you must do right. this I allow them to really just step into them not their natural selves great then i'm gonna kind of zip through the rest of these is there someone who can give like a an example of something you do to foster intergenerational um, communication, uh, intergenerational connection and interaction and building relationships. So again, it's not just the curriculum. It's like, what do you do intentionally, Adam? You talk about using the arts. Um, I know you use writing. Is there anyone who can think of like one example of something that's that really builds that kind of welcoming um, environment for people? Anybody? Just so one thing I can speak to briefly is actually, um, so since this is a class, it's technically one of our assignments. So it's required of our students, but I think that it is something that we often get a feedback that it's one of their favorite parts of the class. And it's actually an interview assignment. So they have to sit down and interview an older person. It could be somebody that they know or one of the students that are taking our class, um, a family friend, you know, whomever it might be. Um, and we give them a list of topics that they can cover, but a lot of times it goes much further than that. And then they have to write a paper on the experience. So we don't necessarily want to know exactly what they said in the right. paper, but what was it right. like to have that interaction and kind of the reciprocity? And then we have found that a lot of times that allows them to then, and we do this a little earlier on in the course, to continue having those conversations with that person throughout the semester and then sometimes even beyond once the course is ended as well, because it kind of opens the door to really having right. those conversations. Right. That's great. And we don't really have time to talk about assessing impact, but I know that Adam, you have a Spencer Foundation grant now that will um, help you look deeper. Um, I think Wash U is doing some evaluation, Lisa doing some evaluation. So, you know, again, one of the things we want to do, we don't have a lot about evaluation in the report because we want to collect that information and understand what people are doing and what's doable. My last thing to you is if each of you had a piece of advice um, for people who are interested in this, uh, we have literally like a few seconds here, but um, what would you say? I mean, you know, you're in it, you've benefited from it. What would you, what kind of piece of advice would you give to people? Anybody? Okay, start, Adam, you start. I'm gonna just go around. Uh, I would say uh, stay with it. Um, I think, you know, when we started the project, we didn't know where it would go. Um, and it was kind of staying with it, building connections, building networks um, and building capacity um, so that the work can uh, flourish in ways that you wouldn't imagine. Great, Lauren? Yeah, and I think building off of that, prioritize making deep connections, even if that means moving a little bit more slowly. Uh, those few long-lasting relationships will yield a lot of other stuff. Terrific. Alicia, real quick, a few seconds. Being flexible. Um, we all have an idea of what we want it to look like. But if you release control, it can blossom into something beautiful. Uh, what a good piece of advice. And Natalie, final word. I would just say also, um, you know, what, flexible was pretty much, you pretty much took mine. So I'll just end with that so we can wrap up. 
Great. Well, thank you all. There's so much more we can talk about. People have asked questions about funding, about evaluation. We hope this is the beginning of more conversations. So many of you around the country can contribute. So I'm going to turn it over to Sherry. I want to thank you all very much. Uh, clapping for all of you. You did a great job. And um, and Sherry, let's end it. We have one minute. <laughs> I know, and, and um, I'll, I'll do my, uh, I'll try to talk fast. Um, we never have enough time for these panels. And I, I just think that this again, like reiterates that we need to put in more time for the panels. So as we close out our program, I wanted to share some next steps. First, we hope you'll download, read and share the report. We've also compiled an intergenerational teaching and learning bibliography that's linked on the report page. And we're currently building a repository of intergenerational teaching and learning evaluation tools, curricula, activities, readings, other materials. It'll be available in the next few weeks. Um, and while we're doing this and exploring several next steps, we'd love your input. Uh, scan the QR code and we'll also include a link in all of our follow-up communication with you. Um, about our interest form. We're collecting information on different intergenerational higher ed initiatives from around the world. We want to add resources to the repository and find out what types of resources, tools, activities would help you with your work. So please don't hesitate to re reach out to me, Nancy or Heather. Our emails are on your screen. I want to thank you again to our panelists today, Natalie, Adam, Alicia, Lauren, for sharing your expertise and experience. I read the report, I knew about it, but so inspiring. Thank you to Nancy and Heather for leading this project. Um, also, thank you to Carrie and the Health Endowment Fund for supporting our work. And then when you leave the webinar, you'll receive a link to a short evaluation form. We really appreciate it if you would take a few minutes to complete that. We read each and every one and use your feedback to plan future events. So again, hope you're inspired by the opportunity for intergenerational teaching and learning in higher ed and the richness of the initiatives that were shared today. Thank you and have a wonderful day.